DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Father Cassian Koneman, who is a monk, priest, and the prior of St. Louis Abbey. With an STL in spiritual theology, he teaches friendship with God and the theology of marriage at St. Louis Priory School. He also accompanies people in spiritual direction and prays with people for inner healing and deliverance. With Father Cassian Koneman, we go inside the pages of The Grace of Nothingness, Navigating the Spiritual Life with Blessed Columba Marmion, published by Angelico Press. In the early 20th century, Blessed Columba Marmion's dogmatically grounded spiritual theology expressed in artful prose, set the Catholic world on fire. A century later, in The Grace of Nothingness, Father Cassian Koneman seeks to rekindle that fire for a new generation with his inspired presentation of Marmion's key spiritual insights. To this task, he brings a monk's sensitivity to friendship with God, a school teacher's focus on the fruits of theology, and a spiritual theologian's attentiveness to grounding it all in proven resources. Blessed Columba Marmion reminds us that God heals and perfects us to the extent we allow him to do so, but that we often block that transformation through prideful self-reliance, trying to solve our problems by our own efforts. If only we place our confidence in God, however, we will receive the grace we need. We now begin our conversation with Father Cassian Koneman. Father, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. I have to say I was thrilled to receive the grace of nothingness, navigating the spiritual life with Blessed Columba Marmion. Talk to us about how you came to know him. Well, it, it is actually by a strange route because I didn't set out to study him. In fact, I think I resisted studying him for, for quite some time. Uh, I was doing a, a license in spiritual theology at the Angelicum in Rome, mm -hmm. and I was reading the greats. Uh, I loved reading Doctors of the Church on Prayer, and I was thinking I was going to study something along those lines. And <laughs> Cardinal Burke kept persisting in, in hinting that I should take a look at uh, Blessed Columba Marmion because the way I was talking about the spiritual life aligns well with the way he describes it in his books. And eventually he got, I think, so impatient with me, he went out and bought one <laughs> and put it in my hands and said, please read this book, uh, Christ, the Life of the Monk. Um, and I, I finally got around to it. And I did find that it was really the wonderful synthesis of the, the things I've been studying. And uh, I ended up reading them all and and then choosing to do a, a license thesis on him. And that's uh, kind of where it all started. It's remarkable, isn't it, that someone who is so gifted and what he's given us, the books that are out there, there's only a handful compared to some other spiritual authors. And yet it's so packed. It's like the, the richest of fruit but I, yeah, the, the corpus is not large. Uh, there, there are a lot of letters, and, and then there are some works. There's a, a wonderful um, book about his letters of spiritual direction. Unfortunately, it's just run out of print. Um, so that was, uh, that was a wonderful one, was, and that's entitled Union with God. Um, but uh, the letters are wonderful as well. Most of them are in French, uh, and there is a collection of his letters in English, uh, as well. He's an Irish priest. Comes from Dublin, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes, and, and then ends up studying in Rome and feels a tug on his heart to become a Benedictine uh, after he started teaching for a little while and thought actually he was going to go to Australia, but ends up in uh, Merid Sioux in Belgium and joins uh, that. Uh, his mother was French, so, you know, he, he felt like he could live in a French-speaking monastery. Uh, real quick story is that for his first retreat, they, they asked for a priest from Merid Sioux, and they didn't have anyone to send. So they said, well, we have this Irishman, but he doesn't really speak the local dialect too well. 
do you really want us to send him? And they said, well, sure, we'll take anyone. <laughs> and he comes and, and he apparently gives a wonderful retreat, a mission for the parish. And uh, they call back the next year and say, no, we want Columba again. And the, and the abbot's so surprised. He said, really? You want, the, you want him? He doesn't even you know, speak your dialect very well. But mm-hmm. he won them over. It wasn't so much about the means. It was more about the message. And he was so able to communicate that, wasn't he? And effective at blending his background in dogmatics, but then reapplying that in a way that's only meant on how to make that effective in a person's spiritual life. Uh, so really grounded in in very wonderful dogmatic principles um, that, for example, um, Christ is constantly working to sanctify every person. And then he says, well, if God's working on it, if he wills it, he's working on it. And, mm-hmm. um, and therefore he's constantly reworking on it as much as he needs to. And I can have confidence in that. And, and, and that's a wonderful principle from which then you could take all kinds of spiritual lessons. I'm so grateful for your book. I'm just going to keep giving the name out because I really want to encourage people to pick it up. The Grace of Nothingness navigating the spiritual life of Blessed Columba Marmion, because he has that Benedictine attribute, doesn't he? I mean, of listening with the ear of his heart. Mm. And you can tell, even if he's navigating through the works of the great Thomas Aquinas and the spiritual life, somehow, because he's listening to that heart connection, he also, in his writings or in his letters to his directees, He's helping them to connect. He's like a great bridge, isn't he? I mean, a bridge between those worlds. And I think the heart is fundamental for him. And, and I think that's what allows him to focus upon what is most helpful for the heart. You know, like I said, he, he has this great intellect. He has this great system of, uh, that he does use, but it's always at the service of growing in holiness, uh, and, and whatever, either in Christ, the life of the soul for the, you know, that's kind of his most popular work, how any soul should, should ha- use these various principles to grow in the spiritual life or in his more specialized conferences to monks or priests. Uh, he, he's got that notion of how do you bring the best out of this to apply it to a person's life and help that person. Just to give a sense to the folks again, he was born, I believe, in 1858. And he died in 1923. Also, Ma, people may not realize, I'm, I'm just kind of, and I'm, again, I'm just giving some background information before we really dive into the heart of the book. But he would go on to be touched by a little one, a little flower named Therese. And he had an important role to play in helping others to see her sanctity, didn't he? Yes, indeed. So as the Pope was considering whether to canonize her, he had actually written off to, to Don Columba, to, to, to Abbot Columba, uh, who was a, a notable spiritual writer of his time and influence, especially in French-speaking uh, Catholicism, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, what do you think? Should I canonize this little flower? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, and, and we have this beautiful reply back from, from Blessed Columba, uh, strongly endorsing her and, and in the most beautiful ways about her, you know, her focus upon God's mercy. And, and, you know, he doesn't quite explicitly say, you know, her going to God with empty hands, but it, it, that's there in the background as well. And uh, I do, enjoy, I did enjoy finding those connections where some of those, those lessons he teaches sound so much like Therese, right? But then placed Obviously, he had learned from her, but then placed in more of a systematic whole than perhaps she had done in the story of a soul. So I, I, I speculate that this is one of those first times that, you know, her lessons are kind of getting slotted into, you know, an overall whole of how to help a person. Oh, it's just beautiful. Now, it, for those who will look at the title of the book, The Grace of Nothingness, sometimes... People may hear the term nothingness. It depends on the culture, perhaps, where you're from. But it's immediately you'll say, well, I'm there. I'm not nothing. 
I'm somebody. You know, God loves me. You can't say that I'm nothing. Or the exact opposite, I know I'm nothing. But not in the way that Don Columba would talk, correct? But this is not what he's speaking of, is he? Yes, well, you've gotten straight to the paradox of the whole thing, haven't you? So um, obviously, our deepest identity is that of a beloved son or daughter of God. And, and that has a vast richness to it, just not only that God's constantly fascinated with each of us, and like, like he teaches, constantly willing and working for each person's holiness and fullest thriving, um, but there are, there's a whole path of blessing and gifts for each person. You know, if we believe our de- identity is uh, somehow associated with a, the father of the prodigal son, uh, you could say that good father, the parable of the good father, right? If, that, if that's the father, he, he really cares for us deeply, uh, not just in receiving us back when we fall, but, you know, putting forth a, a path of blessing for each of us. And uh, so acknowledging all of that as, as our identity and as our gifts uh, and then also acknowledging that those are gifts. And, and that's where, where the, 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 the focus of this work is on the grace of nothingness, that all these gifts that can be received much more easily if you attribute them to God, right? So, you know, the Catholic teaching about merits is that, yes, they're in my life. Like, I, I'm not about to say, like, no, I, I can't teach eighth graders. I've taught eighth graders for many years. If I were to walk into an interview and say, no, I don't know. I don't know if this time I could teach eighth graders. I mean, it's, a, it's an established fact in my life that God's given me the gifts to, you know, walk into a classroom and, and introduce the eighth graders to God and tell them the basic stories of the New Testament and tie it to their lives. Um, there are real merits in my life, and, and some of those are established. Uh, and, and I need to, first of all, acknowledge them, but also attribute them to God for working them in my life. Like, thanks be to God. What a great gift it is to go teach to eighth graders or juniors or seniors or, or adults. Um, so the, the, the title is a bit paradoxical, but it's in this notion of how do we most open ourselves to those gifts? And, and then, then we get into that kind of more interesting, I think, spiritual conversation of, well, how did the saints do it? And so often they said this word, I am nothing. And that's what really started to catch my attention of why are these great saints saying this same phrase over and over and over again? And what's, what's behind it? And I really wanted to break that open. Like they can't, this isn't just a passing phrase for them. And this isn't just a, an expression of low self-esteem. Like I see, I, I don't think I see low self-esteem in Catherine of Siena, you know, calling the Pope to come back from Avignon to Rome. And then next phrase say, well, but I have nothing, you know, uh, there, there's something to these people. Um, so uh, in so many words, there, there's that wonderful par- paradox of all this blessing in a person's life, but then how to open oneself up to it in a way that is most appreciative of all those gifts and and of continuing to receive them. This is what I love so much about the book, Father, because in that beginning, you establish our understanding of what nothingness is, the value of it, of of our understanding and enter into it in our own lives. I think that first and foremost, again, that I think it's 1 Thessalonians 4, 3b, this is the will of God, your sanctification, you know, God is constantly trying to bring us all these graces. Indeed, at Mass, I I think that there's enough grace there already present in the Eucharist to turn all of us into saints. We are the ones that have those obstacles to to that grace, right? And sometimes those are external obstacles, and we can kind of easily point those out. And sometimes those are a little bit trickier, kind of more interior resistance to God that takes a little bit more work to to unravel and to hand over to him. Um, the, the main theory is if you remove those obstacles, the grace is already trying constantly to get into any little crevice you open up. Um, so just open up the way and it'll, it'll come through. Um, and, and that's why fundamentally, I don't think God leaves anyone in a void, right? You know, we'll talk about ascetical practices. If you're overcoming addiction to something, you're going to feel that that emptiness as you make the transition. Obviously, the 
I'm not saying that it's an instantaneous uh, transition, but but God is healing that in, in that moment and and then eventually filling it and, and opening up a spot for more joy in a person's life as well. And that's just on the ascetical side. I think it's easy for us to first think of that, but this is also talking about that more on that spiritual side, um, there's that self-reliance. We always try to say to God, no, I've got this. You know, I don't really need you right this moment. Um, and, and actually we do. And this is kind of opening up that spiritual side of saying, like, no, like I invite you really more fully into my life. And, and a little practical explanation there is, if I have a really hard conversation coming up, uh, and I, I think of like really intense ones that a priest will encounter, you know, think of, uh, for example, I teach boys, think of a young boy who's, who's been into some trauma or, you know, has had a family member pass away or something. And you think, well, even with all the training, you don't have the words to say to this boy. There's that sometimes there are no words to say. But in those more extreme circumstances, it's very easy for me to see like, dear Lord, I am nothing. Just use me as your instrument. Whatever you want to speak to this boy or this person, whoever is experiencing trial, um, you say it or, or whatever you want to say for, you know, this podcast, you say it, work through me. Don't, um, don't let me get in the way. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the kind of disposition that we're talking about here in the grace of nothingness, like inviting God to, to play that much more of a role through a person. That first section of the book of the grace of nothingness, it's also vital to have that understanding of the, the triune God, the gift of the Trinity in which we have been baptized in. That's something that you'll hearken back to throughout the book. But understanding that relationship we've been pulled into and the word planting in us, working through us, in us, the word capital W, Christ Jesus. In that dynamic, we become a part of that whole story by allowing the word to work in us in that way. Does that make any sense? Well, I think what the basis for the whole thing is that Jesus is not only just the exemplar of who we're supposed to be, but he's he's the model. And in fact, he's the one who fulfills the whole thing through us, you know, with the Holy Spirit as well. And, and Marmion, as that, again, that dogmatic teacher is so great, and he can put it in words that I cannot, of, of what that means, just the word son, right? When you t- talk about the word, when you're talking about just God and God's self, that imminent trinity, um, what does that mean, that word son, you know, receiving so much of the father? And he's able to carefully take all those prerogatives into account and, uh, and to navigate all the difficulties. Um, but what's that mean? And then when he becomes incarnate, we have this God man, and, and he's here to show us really what it means to be human. And, and then what does that mean of how he's imaging for us what's possible through grace and the gifts of the Spirit? And, and then how do we follow his example in all of this? And then you add on the next layer where, where he gives us that power uh, through his graces. And the real proof text of, of this entire book is... Uh, when Jesus says in John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Uh, without me, you can do nothing. Uh, so often the saints have then taken that to heart and then changed it over time that I can do nothing without you, or I shorthand, mystical shorthand, I am nothing without you. Um, and then, but add to that, but with you, I can do all things right? And, and how beautiful that is. So that takes the Christian anthropology into account that Jesus has left us this ability to, to live this divinized life and then fulfill his example. And ultimately, the whole thing is about living his example. We can do all things in him. I think sometimes we forget or that he does so much through us. We still have something to offer, even though I am nothing, it doesn't just stop there. It's because we're nothing that he can work. I keep going back to the Mass that we hear over and over again. It's through him, with him, and in him. You can't get around him. 
In today's world, a term that's an ancient term, many of the fathers of the church, the doctors of the church had to deal with it, but it's Pelagianism. And it still rears its head today, doesn't it, in that sense that it's something that we can control, or it's something by or Jansenism, that was something that they dealt with in, in France at that time. You know, that it's all that what we do. And in reality, it's a paradigm of heart, isn't it, Father? Yeah, so, I mean, thinking of Pelagianism, I mean, the first kind of notion is this works righteousness is, is generally the way we, we phrase that. Um, but it, phrasing it another way is we want to win God on our own, right? And we don't. We simply can't. There's no chance. And then you just have to kind of make that change of, okay, I want to receive the gift of God and all that he wants to do with me, including bringing us to heaven, but here and now working through us and, and healing and transforming and perfecting us here and now. Uh, and that's by grace. And then the next thing is, you know, the semi-Pelagianism is, okay, I grant that, but I mean, isn't free will able to do something or won't it do something? And, and then we think, well, maybe I'll initiate the action and God will come along and complete it. Okay, well, perhaps God does from time to time, but really look at how tricky that is, that and presumptuous that is, that um, I'm going to you know, do something great for God and he will bless what I've decided. I mean, that's not discernment. That That's that's you doing your own thing and it may fail horribly until you learn how to actually discern God's way of doing it. The true way, uh, uh, you know, in opposition to semi-Pelagianism is to say that God initiates, sustains, and perfects every good op- action. And, and so he's there at every step in the way. And we choose to cooperate or put an obstacle to it, you know, at the start, at the middle, or at the end. And if you think that you've got control of one of those without God, I, I think that's giving too much. I mean, yes, you can block it, but I, I don't think that you're going to get that path of blessing if you are taking that kind of self-reliant approach of, I've got this middle part, God, and I'll trust on you to finish it off later on. You know, that's that's not quite the right disposition. Now we've hit the wall of suffering because in that need to control in some ways is a reflex by us, isn't it, to to want to avoid a potential suffering, whether it's a physical or emotional or whatever that might be, the need to control it somehow and being able to surrender and saying, I trust you. I trust that God is allowing this. The Father is allowing this for a reason. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. I had never actually thought of it in that way, but I, I think you're you're right. You know, I, I work in, in healing and deliverance ministries, so I do a lot of work, especially in the inner healing of, of deep wounds. And a lot of what you say matches, you know, just that dynamic very closely, Um you know, of course, it's so very human to to resist, to try to control, to try to do perfect or whatever it is. Um, and and yes, at base, often is that wound, you know, that needs some addressing. And thanks be to God, in these last decades, that the church has really realized the gift of inner healing and what can be possible by the works of the Holy Spirit in that whole dynamic. Um, but I, I think also what you're speaking to is that fundamental change of mentality, which is so hard. Um, and what I think Marmion does so well when he says to become a monument of God's mercy. So like that swaps this notion of spiritual accomplishment for this notion of, well, I'm just going to see how God is going to be merciful first to me and then to other people through me this day. And boy, does that change things, right? I mean, they're beautiful aspects, amazing aspects of it. But the interior change there of becoming a monument of God's mercy rather than making yourself into a monument, even for God's glory, is, is really just a very different thing. And he's so good at that. I think that gets at the real fundamental shift that he's trying to propose for people. In the second part of the book, you're talking about what nothingness is. 
and you make that, well, you have to. I mean, it's, it's not only just so Benedictine, it's so Carmelite. It's, it's so hard of those orders that are so focused on prayer, and it's all about humility. Teresa of Avila will say, it's humility, 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 <laughs> over and over again. And you write about it. This is what makes it so practical. An aid to humility with regard to God, and then also to ourselves. And then a very important one in regards to, to us and others. It can't just be God in me or Jesus in me. The nature, even in the Trinity, is one of community, communion, and we're born into and placed in community. It has to reflect itself in our interactions with others, doesn't it? Absolutely. And being as the the Trinity is, being a gift of self to others, right, is Mm -hmm. so fundamental to to who we were actually knit to be like you know put together to be um and all the beautiful reflections from the theology of the body on that and uh yes the the thing is is then we get into those tricky aspects that if we want to be like jesus first of all and his humility and how real profound that is right that whole him in Philippians, uh, of how deeply he's come down to us and been a part of us and suffered for us. I mean, how beautiful is that humility? Mm -hmm. But then trying to put that into our lives, we start to run into all kinds of tricky questions, right? Like, um, first, yes, the humility with God, and that one's actually the relatively easy one. (laughs) The second, Mm -hmm. humility with myself. There's the next degree of hard like, well, then how do I have a proper dignity for myself, right? How do I live out of that proper dignity and yet attribute this all to God? And what does it mean to be mercy? Like, I mean, again, throwing the, to throw this into relief, a notion of forgiving another person, sometimes you're thinking like, well, that's like an injustice to me, right? I mean, right. I see this again in inner healing all the time. There are two different processes. One's forgiveness, and that's about your own inner healing. And then the other process is about justice, and that's down the line or a different process. Um, And how do you, but yet, how do you maintain a proper justice to yourself, right? And how do you get that inner healing of the forgiveness first for yourself? And that's about loving yourself in a proper way, which is actually quite very fundamental. And then... The next question with humility to others, there's there's the bigger question. Oh, but does this mean I'm going to get bullied? Does this mean, uh, you know, something bad's going to happen to me? Uh, and, and how do we apply some of these really deep questions about humility to our interactions with others in a way that, again, is maintaining our dignity, our needs, how we express the needs, perhaps, of the, the common good, in a situation that can be kind of tricky from time to time. Um, But then more fundamentally and more deeply, how do we become that deeper gift of self? That's more like being a father or a mother that's sacrificing for someone else. Um, How do we be that real deep of gift of self like Therese? Then you think of someone who's, who's offered herself on behalf of others. Right. Mm -hmm. And you talk of suffering, like there's, finding meaning in suffering at a whole new level. Um, and we do, we all encounter crosses in our lives. And we know those those days when we have to make those tough choices. And this brings some way of making sense of all of that and bringing some a right measure to how to navigate that. And I think Marmion's great at that as well. He had the ability, he listened deeply as he's directing people, I mean, you you bring out in this wonderful synthesis of a book, I mean, you're bringing in his letters of direction to others. And even in some cases, the fruitfulness that has sprouted because of what he did guide them towards, their response, but then also in the diff- different letters and the other books that you put. I think that's the value of his work in that he's he's taking all of that, which is very I would say deeply dogmatic type of theology, and but bringing it to the earth. I mean, bringing it to the everyday. And as you, as a good son of his, I mean, you're doing the same thing. I mean, you're making it even more accessible and tangible for folks. Well, thank you. And I hope that's the case. And I do think I have updated it, you know, with some mm-hmm. of these, you know, 
reflections of how to integrate it with psychology and such. Um, but what you've really reminded me of is a beautiful little little passage he has of spiritual direction. If you don't mind, I've got like, it's probably like 20 seconds. Sure, no, please do. Gorgeous though. Um, and he's replying to one of his spiritual directees and he says, oh, my dear child, I wish to engrave on your heart in letters of gold this truth that no matter how great our misery, we are infinitely rich in Jesus Christ. If we unite with him, if we lean on him, if we realize constantly by a firm living faith that all the value of our prayer and of all that we do comes from his merits in us, all this is contained in two texts. Without me, you can do nothing, John 15, 5, and I can do all things in him who strengthens me, Philippians 4, 13. I mean, how gorgeous is that line? To engrave on your heart in letters of gold this truth that now, no matter how great our misery, right? Those mm -hmm. times of purification, those times of exterior crosses, we are infinitely rich in Jesus Christ if we unite with him, et cetera. I mean, what, a, what a, not only just what wonderful teaching, but what turn of phrase as well. Before we go, I just have to touch on a couple more points that I want to encourage the reader to find out more about him because, you know, saints make saints. And he is touched by some of the greatest of the masters. And you, you highlight some of them, how... Of course, the great three three doctors of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and Francis de Sales, who he has an interesting appreciation for, and I'm so glad to see that. But it also his Benedictine background, that teachings of St. John Cassian, and so many others. You bring those all together, there's something quite lovely, a dynamic to the spiritual life that I just don't think we see it enough articulated right now in the world, but I think it's longing for it. That you, when you hear people questing in the spiritual life right now, I'm spiritual but not religious, I think this is the answer that people are searching for. Yeah, I think he's very keen to, to um, quote the greats uh, of the tradition, you know, uh, and I think what I tried to do was show how they had very similar teachings to his so that you have a, a series of, of really tried and true um, saints to follow, but then also showing the progression of, of this thought about, about humility and its, its connection to grace and how that has uh, developed in, in, in different ways over time and how it's reaching, I think, a new flourishing today, and it will continue to develop. I mean, I, I think it, we're in a wonderful spot as in terms of spiritual theology in the church at this moment, and uh, it's wonderful to look back to him and it's wonderful to look forward to the future and what, and, and of course to today and what we can do in it all. He gives us that Benedictine anchor. I mean, he's able to pull in the greatest of the, of the masters of prayer, but yet there is that touching of the listening of the receiving that is so Benedictine in nature, I think. Maybe it's bold of me because I'm a Benedictine oblate. And he realizes the need for balance in your life, the stability that the human person needs. So when you incorporate all these different things, it has to also be what that person is meant to be and not a replica of another. You know, you're very careful in that too in guiding people through this process the input in their own life that they don't strive to be somebody else or to accomplish things on their own or to allow god to do what he's going to be do in the uniqueness and beauty of your own soul that we don't see the beauty in ourselves right well god needs each of us to be uniquely ourselves i mean he made us uniquely ourselves for good reason so uh, we need to each be that yeah, he's Benedictine in character in focusing on humility as the ba the basic way of overcoming our self-reliance and our, as the basic aspect of pride for most people. Um, and he's Benedictine in character because he just looks at what's best out there at the moment and how to best apply it. Uh, so. Yeah, and needing the needs of those who he's encountering, whether it be a reader or the person standing in front of him, you know. 
One more final note on the book that I thought was so wonderful is how you broke open the three stations in the course of a day. Namely, as you said, they're what we were, what we are, and what we could become. The fact that we should reflect on that daily. What we were, what we are, and what we could become. That was his spiritual advice to so many of those he encountered. And I think in the third part of the book, Applying Marmion Spirituality to Your Life, you help us so much in making that applicable as a spiritual exercise for our own lives. Yeah, I mean, just really quickly, what we were, you could say, you know, we've all been saved out of something that's been kind of tricky in our lives, perhaps. Uh, what we are now is dependent upon God. And, you know, that's what he, he helps us with the phrasing of how to be most dependent upon God and helpful in that way. And uh, then what we could become, you've got two different routes there, right? You've got the presumption that could go the wrong direction and uh, faint heartedness that could get you say, Oh no, not me. Um, But how to have a proper humble confidence in God that helps us really find our path of blessing forward all the way to union with God. Uh, The church has taught that's, that's really a, a, as who is it that puts it this way? I think Dorothy, Dorothy Day puts it this way. Just the obligation of us all at this point after the church has defined it as the universal call to holiness. Um, and then, of course, we didn't touch upon it, but his influence on Mother Teresa there, uh, who, mm-hmm. again, is a temporary witness of the, the, the real soundness of this doctrine, because uh, this is exactly where she picked up lessons from him. Quick footnote, Dorothy Day, Benedict Noblet. So (laughs) just have to say it. I have to say it out loud. Father Cassian, any final thoughts? I mean, wish we had more time, but any final thoughts? It's been wonderful to to talk about the book. It's been wonderful to talk about Marmion and the Saints. I mean, it's just a privilege to be able to do that. Uh, I I hope that the book is something that that, um, gives a simple... uh, aid to people and how to live out uh, the graces that are already kind of on offer for them and how to open themselves to those and hopefully um, challenge them a little bit on, on how to grow and take their next steps with God. Thank you so much for your time and all great blessings to you. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. With Father Cassian Koneman, we've gone inside the pages of The Grace of Nothingness, Navigating the Spiritual Life with Blessed Columba Marmion. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, visit angelicalpress.org, the website for its publisher, Angelical Press. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.